to kind of kick into the same uh, direction. So, Mark, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about deformity correction using lengthening nails. So we've heard that we are really kind of changing to from frames to lengthening nails. And there are quite a lot of patients that can, that can go well with pure lengthening, but in many patients we do have some varus and valgus deformity that we want to address at the same time. And so we have a couple of possible approaches to do so. So in, we can do this in one osteotomy. We can use rigid reamers, we can create a canal which is stable for this, and uh, so correct the deformity like this. We can do it in one osteotomy using external fixation. We can use blocking screws uh, and to get the correction. We could do a simultaneous lengthening nail with a simultaneous second osteotomy to do the uh, deformity correction. In PEATS, there is a very elegant way of doing it. We can use guided growth combined with, uh, with the lengthening nail. And there is another option which we usually don't do is that we, we can do the lengthening with the nail and then do a subsequent deformity correction with nail or plate. So uh, we've been quite influenced by, by Rainer Baumgart because we've been using uh, the fit bone nail for a couple of years. We've done like 50 fit bone nails and we're quite, uh, quite happy with those. The biggest problem was the size uh, and that there were, there were not many so different implants. So we happily changed to the precise ones that came out. But we really keep using Rainer Baumgart's techniques. And so for a case like this, this was an 18 year old uh, with a CFD and fibula pemimilia and a valgus deformity and shortening. We did the reverse planning uh, like the endpoint first method according to Rainer Baumgart. And you can see, uh, so this was, you've seen it was published in 2009 and so originally it was like all on tracing paper which was nice, kind of artful, but not very practical. So we usually use TraumaCAT to do the same thing and you know it works pretty much in the same way as you've seen it for Bone Ninja. Now, what we end up with is, maybe go back here, what we end up with is uh, how it should look like at the beginning of lengthening. And this is what we try to recreate. So during surgery, I want to see this picture here. So I want to know where is uh, the path of the nail at the level of the osteotomy. So we use uh, the external fixation, so one pin uh, posterior to the path of the nail, one pin proximal to the nail, and then we try to recreate the same picture. So this is diamond pin, three millimeters. And for severe deformities, we are using uh, the instrumentation from the fit bone, which is in fact a very sophisticated tube system and rigid remus, which make it even more, uh, I think, more easy to, to do this. So you can see this, the protection sleeves, uh, they have a big advantage. They really give you the direction of reaming, and the second thing is, so all your reamings come, they don't stay within the joint. They really come out. You can very nicely clean that out of the knee joint. So there are, are rigid reamers. They're a little bit frightening at the beginning. They're very big and very strong, so you really need to be careful what you do with this, especially in the second plane that you're not seeing in the x-ray. And so what we do is we just ream up to the osteotomy, then we do the osteotomy, we correct, and then we keep on reaming. So originally, uh, Rainer Baumgart is doing this without uh, the external fixation. For me, the external fixation gives me some additional stability and security, and I prefer to do it like this. So we insert the nail, we check the alignment, then we do the locking and the blocking screws. And again, you've seen this, the blocking screws are very important, especially if you have a wide canal to, to maintain the correction. And you know, you always have to think about where the bone wants to go. So in the tibia, it's like procovatum, valgus, in the femur, it's uh, again, some procovatum, sometimes more varus, so it really depends. And this is the case, so this is when we started lengthening, and you can see this is at the end of lengthening, we have exactly the desired uh, uh, correction. Uh, there was no need for blocking screws, uh, like on the posterior aspect, because here we have nice contact with uh, the corticalis. This was at the end of distraction, six weeks, uh, six weeks after the operation. Full weight bearing was possible four months after the operation. 
Uh, this was the picture six months later, 12 months later. Sometimes if you do the acute correction, you get a little bit of a, a callus defect on the lateral side, but the nail was removed after 18 months with a very good result. So if we, if we only deal with mild deformity, then we don't need to use uh, the rigid remus, like a deformity like this we can do with flexible remus. Uh, and so it's the same when we just correct a little bit of valgus to, to anticipate for the valgus we get from lengthening along the anatomic axis. So, but principally it's the same thing. We, again, we use the external fixator, uh, K-wire, we ream, we, def we, we, we perform the deformity correction, we go again with the reamer, and then we put in the blocking screws. And again, this is at the end of the surgery. It should look exactly like you're planning. And then at the end of correction, you want to have a perfect axis. We can do the same for big valgus deformities. And you know, it's a little bit about the osteotomy. If you, the more deformity you get, the lower you want to be with your osteotomy. If you have less deformity, you can do it a little bit higher. So uh, the osteotomy level is in part kind of influenced by uh, the amount of deformity you get. In this case, the deformity was quite significant. We wanted to correct about 10, 11 degrees of uh, valgus. Again, we do an exact planning here, and you can think that if, we, if you go more proximal, you would ream away something of the medial cortex to get this correction. So this is something you want to, to consider during your operation. Again, you can see our sleeves, and you can see the rigid rim, and you can see maybe in this picture that the rigid rim is really a very big thing. So you always need to check the lateral view to make sure that you don't thin out, that you don't thin out the cortex on the anterior port, uh, a portion which might lead to a fracture. And you can again see the ample use of blocking screws. This was during lengthening. You can see it's a very big nail, which is really nice because the 12.5 nail, you're not very nervous about the patient doing more weight bearing than you suggest, and they always do. And so this was at the end of lengthening with a good result. This was six months after surgery, four months after surgery, very quick uh, consolidation. Now we can do the same for Veros. This is a vitamin D resistant rickets with a very crazy deformity on the left side that was corrected with, uh, with an external fixator. On the right side, when we do our planning, we can see that the tibia is normal, the MPTA is just 87. So we can do exactly what we said before. We extend the line, we find our deformity, and we plan the correction using nails. We plan uh, the osteotomy level, and then we, we recreate this. So during surgery, I take a pen, I mark the osteotomy. I sometimes use skin closing clips to mark the osteotomy and mark the end of the nail so that during reaming I can see exactly where I am. Uh, and then as you can see, we, we correct the deformity, hold it with the fixator, then keep on reaming and bring in the nail. And in this case, you don't need blocking screws on this side because the cortex is against the nail, so there's no way the nail can go. But uh, so on the medial side, you definitely need this. There wasn't a lot of leg length discrepancy, so the lengthening was uh, pretty quick. And you can see this is the long-standing x-ray. So at the end of lengthening, with a very nicely corrected axis. Uh, Sometimes the anatomy is more proximal, and sometimes you can, uh, you still want to use an external fixator, but you don't need to think about blocking screws like in the diaphysis. This was a seven year old female with an open fracture, a leg length discrepancy of nearly four centimeters, and uh, non union. She came like this, still on crutches, still a non union. And uh, so I put on a frame with two pins, two pins. Uh, with a gradual correction clamp, and I removed the plate, I straightened out the femur, and then I brought in the remus and the nail, and uh, so corrected the alignment, and just distracted the non-union after I've done a couple of drill holes there. In the tibia, we can do the same thing. We are maybe a little bit more limited because the, the, the canal is not so wide, so you're more limited with the amount of correction you can get away with. Uh, and again, of course, it depends on where the core, where uh, the apex of the deformity is. 
So this patient had uh, a quite significant virus deformity, so, uh, and the leg length discrepancy of about 2.5 centimeters. Uh, again, we do our trauma cat planning. We can find uh, the cora, which very nicely is pretty much in the area where I wanted to do my osteotomy. And uh, so with this planning, I already see where my nail should go, because in this case, it's very easy in the tibia, because you really plan along your anatomic axis anyway. And so this is what it should have looked like in the end. The lateral view is not very nice. It's not a real lateral view, so not very suitable for planning. So sometimes your x-rays are, yeah, should be better. And so what we always do in the tibia, we do a distal tibial uh, transfixation, a transmolleular screw to, to protect the ankle joint, that there is no uh, proximal migration of the fibula. So next step in a case like this is you need to do the fibula osteotomy and because we are correcting from varus to valgus, we need to remove a piece of bone. Next step, we mount the fixator, two pins, like one in the posterior, one in uh, uh, distal to the nail, and then we do a tibial osteotomy, acute correction, we complete the reaming, we do the proximal locking, again, followed by blocking screws. And you see, this is a blocking screw which goes uh, from medial to lateral. So this is posterior to the nail to prevent procovatum, which is something which I feel is very important when dealing with the tibia. But again, you can see, uh, of course, there is more room in the tibia sometimes if you do a more proximal osteotomy, so more need for blocking screws. This is the postoperative x-ray, and so this was at the end of lengthening, and you can see the end of lengthening in the real x-ray looked pretty much the same as in the planning, so we were quite, quite happy with this. You can see there's no procovatum. You can see that the screw, the posterior screw here, really prevents procovatum during lengthening. Uh, we always transfixed fibula on both ends, and this was the final alignment uh, at the end of lengthening with, with already some good bone healing. Bifocal correction, simultaneous lengthening and plating. Um, yes, maybe. Uh, we've, I have memory of this case because, uh, so this case was sent in by colleague and you know we planned the lengthening. Then we saw, oops, there is a virus deformity on the distal tibia and we decided to, to correct both to the lengthening and correct uh, the distal uh, tibial deformity. So. I, I did the lengthening nail and I did an opening wedge osteotomy at the distal tibia at the same time. Uh, I do remember doing a fasciotomy in this case. So it is a lot of osteotomy at the same time, so I think it increases uh, the risk of complications quite significantly. I was very lucky with this one, so no problem, but I think it was close. So maybe I think this is something, especially on the tibia, that should be considered very well. But nevertheless, we had a nice axis and a good alignment of the distal tibia in both planes. And a good callus formation. So in summary, I think planning is really the key, and I think whenever you want to correct a femoral deformity, uh, the endpoint first, the reverse planning method, is, is a really very useful technique. Uh, the rigid remus we really like to use for severe deformities in the femur, uh, but still always combined with blocking screws. For moderate mild deformities, I think you can get away with flexible remus and the blocking screws. And of course, in the tibia, especially if you do correct, uh, if you do correct deformity in the tibia, and if you keep on reaming after you have done your osteotomy, you need to be very considerate uh, and 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 be aware of compartment syndrome and do a prophylactic fasciotomy. Thanks.